Okay, so we're going to get started since we're live now, which is very exciting. Um, my name is Courtney Brown, and I work for Maximus. I'm the Military Talent Network Manager, um, and I'm a Navy veteran. And so instead of me introducing everybody, um, Jim is going to kind of introduce himself, then Haley, and then Ann. So Jim, you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks, Courtney. I'm Jim Beamister for Vice President of Veterans Initiatives at Prudential, and I'm an Army veteran. Great. Haley? Hi, everybody. I'm Haley Schofield with U-Haul International. Um, I am our recruiting communications analyst, and I also lead the charge on recruiting veterans for our organization. Brilliant. Anne. Hi, my name is Anne Treadway. I'm the director of the Office of Veteran and Military Programs and Services at Rutgers University. Brilliant. And so I'm sure people know what we're going to talk about today, but I'll just reiterate. Um, we're talking about tracking veterans in the work, workplace and why that's important. Um, although we all work in different segments, um, you know, from, from gym and insurance, uh, me and more or less of the consulting business, and then we have Anne and the, you know, the Scholastic, we all kind of have that same need to track veterans. So I would like to really ask the first question to Anne, and, and this is really for all the panelists, but let's just start with Anne for this one. Why do you think it's important to track veterans in the workplace? One of the most important reasons is visibility. Um, you know, you're increasing the chances for a lot of different things, whether it be clientele or encouraging other staff to identify themselves. Veterans are often reluctant to identify themselves. We see this in higher education. Um, I've heard stories in the corporate world about uh, someone not wanting to disclose them because they're afraid that they're going to be judged because of their military affiliation, um, seen as rigid. You know, and, and research conducted with hiring professionals, that actually came out as much as people are very appreciative um, by someone's military service, they often find them possibly too rigid to be working with others or uh, not adaptable. So, you know, the more visibility, the more likely you're going to encourage other staff to identify themselves. Um, and overall, that just leaves to professional development opportunities. Um, it allows you to uh, access, I think, clientele that you wouldn't have access to before as well. Good point. So Haley, um, did you have anything to add? Um, no, I'm just going to, I mean, echo what Ann said. Absolutely. It's um, encouraging other veterans. It's putting yourself on the map as a veteran friendly employer, you know, for U-Haul. U-Haul uh, was founded by a veteran in 1945, so hiring veterans is a huge part of sustaining our company culture. So being able to track and identify who our veterans are kind of allows us to wave that flag and, and let veterans know that we are a veteran-friendly employer, which increases our pipelines and helps us increase our hires as well. Brilliant. Jim? For some, employ for some companies, for some employers, they might be a federal contractor and there might actually be a requirement to record this information and track this status of, of their veteran employees. Um, but besides that, the reason it's important and it's a good thing for all employers to do this is a lot of what we've already heard, which is simply you can amplify bringing more talent into your organization by showing the talent that's already there that, that are veterans um, we've had many times we do this thing called the value of veteran hiring manager training, and we do it by business unit and by location. And we always include a, a veteran from that local business unit in the presentation. And many times coworkers didn't even know that person was a veteran because we don't necessarily wear it on our sleeve or we don't necessarily have all this love me wall stuff in our cubicle or in our office. So People don't necessarily think of you, Jim or Courtney or or Ann or Haley or George or anybody as being a veteran. They think of you as what you do for the company. Um, but by seeing the veterans that work amongst us, we get that better sense of, yes, veterans can really contribute to our company rather than some of those preconceived notions of why do we need an infantry soldier to work at Prudential or why do we need a truck driver or a fighter jet pilot to work at Prudential, what can they possibly do for us? Well, guess what? We already have them working here. Uh, it's all interesting that you say this, but you know, on the inverse, I mean, I'm looking at also the chat too. I think um, there is a lot of stigma um, of veterans self-identifying, right? Um, and I know Ann and I have talked about this, but you know what I would like to do, because again, this is in the chat, when you think about why veterans don't I self-identify and why do you think that is? I mean, I have my own opinion working in corporate America and what I've been told and as a veteran, right? So could you give me some kind of examples of maybe things you've heard or trends you've seen? Well, we often see in the media since I, since I 
the extreme, you know, sides of uh, service. You have uh, on one end, you know, the killer, the troubled service member. And when I say media, I mean all media. We see this in the news. A uh, veteran is often the identifier of someone. You know, if someone commits a crime, doesn't matter what they do for a living, veteran or their military affiliation is going to be in the headline, right? They could have served for two months 30 years ago. And, and usually that's still the main identifier. So you have news, you have uh, popular media, you have movies, right? So these extremes, again, like a killer, a broken soldier, or another extreme where this person's a hero, right? Um, and I, I often joke, I'm like, in no time during the military did I look like G.I. Jane, right? Or uh, I'm pretty sure, actually, I might have once in my life been able to do a one-arm push-up, but it definitely was not in the Army. Um, so you have those two extremes. And because of that, you're then getting identified with whatever the person's opinion is of those things, right? So, and so there's a lot of reasons why someone might not want to disclose that because they don't want to be prejudged based on whatever the person considers to be um, characteristics of someone who served. Well, um, I think that's part of it, you know, um, but I, I also think um, as a company, um, just again, from my perspective at work is that, um, you know, we don't sometimes in corporate America really uh, properly define what a veteran is when we're asking them to self-identify. So I want to give you guys an example, right? I think at maximum, so we're doing better, but on the forms, you know, it'll be specific. It'll say Vietnam veteran, right? Um, and then it'll say Gulf War era, right? But a lot of people feel like, well, technically that doesn't define me. Maybe I was in the military at that time, but I didn't deploy. So I don't feel like checking that box, right? Um, and some of the questions have been very specific, like, are you a disabled veteran? Well, no, but I'm a veteran, so let me just not check the box, right? So um, I think it's two of those things. Um, and when you've seen your forms, Jim, do you, I mean, at Prudential, have you guys kind of had that same experience talking to your HR uh, professionals there saying that if we change these forms, perhaps we may get more people to self-identify? Yeah, so this is a very personal topic for me because when I first joined the company in 1997, the question that we asked was related to, are you a Vietnam era veteran? So of course I had to select no. Um, and then when I looked into my HR profile, there was just a mark that said, you know, veteran, yes or no. And of course it said no, because the question that I answered was, was I a Vietnam era veteran? But I was a veteran and I am a veteran, but yet in the HR record, it said, no, I'm not a veteran. So fast forward, I get into my, my current role and I said, we really need to look at the question we ask. And part of the issue is um, the whole topic of how do we define a veteran? How does the veteran define a veteran or think of themselves? There's many people who served in the military, perhaps a long time ago, who don't really identify as a veteran anymore because that was a short time in their long life that they kind of put in their past. Or they never served in combat or they served in the National Guard or the reserves and they don't think of themselves in the same way as somebody who served on active duty, especially if they didn't get called up for a deployment. So there's all these nuances of how an individual might think of it. And then there's the nuances of how a company might ask the question that then gives them the information that they incorrectly use. So we have since revamped our form and it just says, have you ever served in the United States military? Or are you currently serving in the United States military? Bang, that's it. That's the first question. Now, we have subsequent questions, if you select yes, where we try to get at if you might be a protected veteran. But we, years ago, we asked, are you a protected veteran? And I was like, you know what? Who knows the definition of a protected veteran, right? The average veteran does not know the definition of a protected veteran. So don't ask them a question they don't know the answer to ask the questions that they will easily be able to answer that will allow you, the employer, to understand what their status would be. And, you know, it's like many things in life. Make it simple. It'll get done. Right. Right. No, I agree. And so on that topic of identification of the veteran themselves and us doing um, a better job maybe of identifying them, um, I'm sure that a lot of programs and a lot of companies have come out of that. I know there was a, a someone mentioned ERGs. Um, in, in the chat. And I know that our company, um, because we've had uh, challenges with identifying veterans, when we started to identify more, we said, you know, there needs to be a space 
for these individuals. And so we created ERGs. So Haley, in your personal opinion, and maybe things that you've seen at work, do you think the identification of veterans have you know, spawned new programs at your place of employment? Uh, most definitely. I, I have been in charge of one of our veteran appreciation programs for many years. Um, team members who identify themselves as a as a veteran, both in the U.S. and Canada, since uh, U-Haul operates in both U.S. and Canada, uh, once they reach 90 days of service, they are sent a special edition package. It's a U-Haul veteran hat that they wear at work, a pin, a personalized letter from the CEO thanking them for their service. Um, so we really try to nurture this environment where we want to honor them even as their service to U-Haul. Do you, do you do something like that as well, Anne, um, at school, at your school? Well, we do it with our students. And again, it has to do with visibility. But, you know, I was saying before, there's sometimes extremes. Um, only half of 1% of the population has served since 9-11, uh, 2001. Very few people have served in the military. Very few people are related to someone who served in the military. So again, the media, there's a lot of places we get our understanding of what it is to be a to be a veteran or be someone who's been in the military or is currently serving. So the other aspect of exactly what U-Haul is doing and what, what Prudential is doing, which is so amazing, is by raising visibility of those who serve, you're showing how diverse your military affiliated staff are. You know, not many women serve. I think at this point it's about 18% of the military is women. So when we think of veteran, and this is to pick up on what Jim said, you know, there's a, a specific image to an extent and you're thinking often of, you know, older white men who are outside the supermarket, you know, with poppies, uh, with VFW members, American Legion. Um, and it, the most important thing is how we ask, you know, did you serve in the military? Or are you currently serving? And then you're going to find the diverse population. So we do it with students. Um, Rutgers is working on doing it with faculty and staff. Uh, and you're encouraging, right, when you when you raise that visibility, you're encouraging others um, to come out and, and identify themselves as military affiliated. Great. Um, as you um, said as that, you said, you know, I've been looking at the chat too and monitoring and someone asked a question about Coast Guard. Um, and I can just tell you from my company, um, we identify, uh, because my title, military talent, it means not only uh, active duty or retired or veteran, it also means someone who could have been in the guard, right? That's applicable to us. Um, and we've even expanded that when we talk about military affiliation. I also work with IMSEP, you know, military spouses as well. So that's the same group of people. And those people are also in our ERGs, right? Um, so just to answer that question. So Jim, do you guys do something very similar where in your identification process, you have guard, you have uh, reservists and things like that, as far as uh, someone checking the box, would that be applicable to them as well? So we don't have on uh, on our application process and on our recruiting process, um, we do have military spouse self-identification options. We don't for reserve and National Guard currently, nor do we track that. But we do actively recruit from both sources. We did receive the, um, the 2021 Freedom Award from the Secretary of Defense for our uh, programs that support our employees that are in the Guard and the Reserve. So it is a segment that we actively uh, look at for talent, and we find that there's great talent amongst the Guard and the Reserve. And, you know, we've had no issues. In One issue I hear from some employers is, well, what about when they leave for a deployment? What about when they go away for six months and it's unexpected? No, it hasn't really been a problem. We One thing we've always done is to make sure that we don't have too many in the same unit in the same work function at work because then there might be a situation that that would cause a problem but i can tell you in the past 10 or 11 years we've not once had that be an issue and we haven't even had to do anything to try to rearrange where anybody was working to prevent it from being an issue it just the odds are it doesn't work out to, to cause a problem it's this notion that uh, people might have in their head that isn't a true problem um, the one thing I'd like to tie back to, too, is the ERG concept, because that's a great way to kind of wrap these things all together and allow people who are in the Guard and the Reserve to participate in the same kinds of things as our veterans and our military spouses and to help those populations uh, cross inform each other, because there's a lot of people who served on active duty who don't really understand the Guard and the Reserve that well. There's also, in, in Prudential, we have about 50 percent of our ERG members are not veterans, military spouses, or have ever served in the Guard or the Reserves. They're allies. 
but by being in that same BRG or ERG and participating in the same activities, they are learning about military culture. They're learning about their military colleagues and they're gonna be advocates out in the business about military talent. And that's just a, that's a big win across the board for us. Um, so moving past that question, someone made it raise a co uh, comment here and was speaking about uh, identification in the civil workforce. I I'll just kind of address that. It's, it's a little bit different, I think, because what we're talking about, what Ann Haley and Jim and I are talking about are more in the corporate environment, right? When we're looking at, um, you know, like federal jobs, you get points for that, right? Not every corporate employer does that. So I think that's where the difference lies. So when you find that if you go for, you know, a police officer job or something where they're giving you points or they're allowing you to make your active or reserve time applicable to time served there, it's a little bit different in corporate America. We we don't follow that same pattern. And this is why we need to have these conversations, right? Um, you know, not to make it necessarily even playing field between us and a federal government. We're not competing with that. We just want to make sure that we're treating our, our veterans and our veteran uh, affiliated talent fairly, right? We just want to make sure that there's opportunities for everybody. Um, so as I address that question, my next question was for Haley. Um, looking at your bio and your profile, I just want to make sure I'm correct. You work like in, with analytics, right? And ad advertisement, is that correct? I do, yes. I, I wear a few different hats. So okay. I'm, I'm, I work a lot on the back end with our software, and but I'm also very much um, a front end person in communications and marketing when it comes specifically to attracting veteran applicants. Okay, that makes sense. So when you think about what we've been talking about with Jim and Anna, and I've talked about my ERGs and identification, how do you actually use that information when you're, you know, doing these, when you're doing your marketing plans or when you're using the analytics at work? Um, and when you do use that information, what kind of results have you seen based on uh, the identification process at work? You know, we're 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 reevaluating that because we we've changed software over the past couple of years. So there seems to be some um, we believe some people that have slipped through the cracks. So looking at that information and comparing it to years past um, is really important. But what we drive out of that is we're looking at our numbers. Um, if we're seeing a decrease in veteran employees, we're looking for ways to get ourselves out there more and advertise more. From And this is from a hiring perspective. Um, we're actually just uh, getting ready to kick off a big communication campaign based on our numbers to make sure that everybody we do have currently working for us knows how to go in and, and self-identify as a veteran um, and such. Now, something that I that uh, Jim mentioned that is something that's also on my radar is tracking uh, military spouses and family support members because um, there's we, we we currently ask this question on our job application, asking you know if somebody is affiliated with the military or if they've had military service. We also ask them if they've been referred by a military. Um, employment program or military spouse employment program. So we're starting to kind of get our feet wet in that space to better create partnerships with organ organizations that um, specify with military spouses. We're going to say something, Jim, you look like I don't want to ignore you because I was going to ask Anna a question, but then you look like you're mouthing something or were you just typing it? And I just I was sending a response to somebody. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was like, I know he's trying to say something, but I, I don't want to be rude and just go, excuse me, Haley, it's Jim's turn. I uh, know. <laughs> um, you know, as far as when we if, 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 if implement, implement these programs, programs at work, um, like the like ERGs, um, can you tell me, Anne, from your perspective, have you seen like a stark increase? Maybe, and I'll give you an example. On Veterans Day, you know, we do the stereotypical, you know, these are some of our veterans. But then at the bottom of the communications, we say, if you are a veteran, this is a great time to self-identify so you can be part of this, this and this. Right. Do you think sometimes you'll see an uptick if you do these kinds of events at work? And if you do, what kind of events have been the most successful that you've done? I think they do. I think visibility matters. So I'll just give you an example. And again, I'm in higher education. Um, so with our students and uh, you know, my office represents faculty and staff who are veterans or military affiliated faculty and staff as well. Um, we marched in the New York City parade in 2019, Veterans Day parade. Um, the school had picked that up as well. They broadcast photos of all of us in our shared uh, Rutgers veteran uh, sweatshirts and just showing that type of support um, and all of us together. We got calls uh, from people we'd never seen, students who had been here for three, four years who had never come to our office knew about us. And again, it comes back to the word, and I hate to circle back, but visibility, right? Um, and visibility, and not only in showing how diverse the population is, it's also creating uh, and fostering an environment 
environment of support for this population that includes spouses and dependents. Um, so, you know, I think doing those events, ones that are that are creating and fostering community, um, you know, are going to again uh, bring your military affiliated staff in, are going to encourage them to identify themselves, and are going to you know foster that community and that visibility amongst the entire corporation. So, Jim, I know that you said that you have programs in the workplace as well. Do you have particular events and or programs that you feel have you know brought the numbers up just a little bit uh, for veterans to self-identify? Yeah, absolutely. So what's interesting about it is we kind of have a couple different things that we do. Some of them are designed more around volunteer activities, like maybe doing care packages or doing resume reviews or, or um, some kind of workshops around employment opportunities. Um, we even do some things like visiting the uh, the VA hospital in East Orange. We go to Rutgers and we talk with, with Ann's crew at the Student Veteran House, uh, talk about careers at Prudential just across the board. Um, but one of the things that we do is, and we do this across all of our ERGs, is we make sure we're providing professional development opportunities as well. And by that, we might have um, some of the projects that we do. So, and the project might be an event and we'll have some of the ERG members be the project manager. They might be the one that has to coordinate with the chairman's office for the chairman to participate in the Veterans Day event. And uh, let me tell you, that's uh, quite a visibility opportunity that they might not otherwise get. And then when they're involved doing some of that work, whether it's a, a big event, uh, Veterans Day at, at the Pru Tower in Newark, or a smaller event, you know, they're getting some visibility, which is what Ann was just talking about, right? People, once they see that there's a lot of different reasons this is beneficial to me, people, more people get to know who I am, I get some visibility across the organization, I get some developmental opportunities, I get exposure, now all of a sudden you have people coming out of the woodwork saying, how do I get more involved with this? I want to be involved. And that's great because what we really want is as many people to be involved. We can do a lot more. We have, um, you know, we sponsored the creation of the USO Center over at Newark Liberty International Airport. And it got to the point we had so many volunteers going over there. We actually started using one of the employee shuttles to shuttle volunteers over there during the day. And it was something we coordinated through our VetNet ERG. And the company said, sure, we'll set aside one of the company shuttles within Newark just to go to the airport and take volunteers. And it's simple things like that where the ERG can actually recommend some things that are also going to have an impact and make a difference, right? So it's not just about volunteering. It's also about now opening your eyes and seeing, wow, we, people care about what we do. What more can we do to support the community and our fellow employees who are veterans? Good. Um, I want to kind of uh, stay on top of it, but go off of it a little bit. I don't know um, if you've uh, received communications, any of you three, when the notification came out for this presentation. And, you know, all of our emails are out there somewhere in cyberspace, right? I got an amalgamation of communications saying, hey, Courtney, I'm at XYZ Company. You know, what have you done at your company to kind of move the needle along, right? Um, and I kind of talked about the programs we have, but um, as a sneak peek, right? Not so you guys have to divulge any secrets. I mean, I, I'm sure at one time we all had top level so you know, clearances, nothing like that. But um, I would like to um, ask this first question to Haley, because since you're more in the marketing and kind of putting the information out there, do you have like something that could help other employers that are on this call right now, maybe a program that you're developing, some kind of ideas to kind of get people's brains flowing other than what we've talked about? Do you have something on the horizon? Yes, um, I, I actually, and this kind of correlates, I was reading a note in the chat about um, talking about the misconceptions of hiring military. And I know we talked a little bit about this earlier. And we recently did this with my own recruiting group as we partnered with a local um, veteran organization to do an entire education seminar on why veterans are beneficial to an organization, what some of the perceptions are. I mean, it was it was this great slide deck. And I remember one of them is like, what veterans want you to know? And the first bullet point on there was, we don't all have PTSD. Um, and I found that so valuable. So that would be my suggestion to other organizations is invest in educating your core group who is 
you know, and, and like, I, again, I'm speaking from a recruiting perspective, but here's the great part of this is when we have our recruiters up to speed and educated on, um, you know, the myths and truths of, of hiring veterans, our recruiters are then educating their hiring managers as they're marketing veterans to those hiring managers for employment at our company. Yeah, I mean, that's really good. I think that's important. Um, and I do like the recruitment piece because technically, um, by definition, my job is uh, falls under recruitment, even though that's technically not what I do. Um, and I, I think there's real value add to that because I feel like it doesn't matter um, what group you're trying to vet, whether it's veterans or, you know, um, underrepresented minorities, whatever the case is, right? If you're asking them to self-identify and you want to bring them in the company, it's kind of that with them, right? We've all heard that in sales. Like, what's in it for me? Why should I come here? And why should I self-identify? Give me a reason to want to be part of your group, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's ideas like that. When you have the recruiters who are in touch, when they reach out to their customers who are veterans in the circumstance saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not a veteran or I am. And this is kind of what we can offer based on what whatever um, you know the veterans here are telling me i think that's really important um because you, it's really true you never get a second chance to make that first impression right so if we're not listening to our veterans and our veteran population then that's where we fall short right um, but an example of kind of what we're doing is something like what Jim is doing at his company um and i Jim still the idea for me no he didn't do that um we uh, we have cohorts as well um, that kind of start out with not necessarily people from our ERGs, but uh, we've worked with a number of institutions and like programs like the O2O, you know, um, and brought people in to start, uh, you know, veteran only cohorts. And that'll be spouses, um, sometimes the reserve officers, but they're a specific skill set because at our company we do consulting, but it's not just focused on one thing. It's healthcare, care. Um, it's also technology and things like that. So our last cohort, we had people that were brought in just in the tech space. So all these ITs were military affiliated and we knew they were trained because they came from a program that was you know, already training them to do that. So it's, it's great saying we value you so much. We're going to make a program just for you to kind of come in at the manager level. Right. And, you know, kind of move on with that. Um, but that kind of gets my, my brain thinking a little bit. And I know we're kind of short on time here. Um, I was going to ask this question to Jim really quickly. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have told me personally is that when they're vet vetting veterans and, you know, their spouses and, you know, the whole umbrella, that a lot of companies um, will only vet them for certain level of work. And I brought that up to you specifically because as a VP at, at a company, you would probably know this better than anyone. And there was also something, uh, somebody mentioning that in the chat as well. Um, I feel a lot of veterans have come back and told me, well, yeah, Court, I would have gone with this company, but they only want me for a CSR, right? They don't want to identify me as C-suite or, you know, middle management. Um, so have you kind of had something similar where veterans are telling you that, or have you seen that in the industry? Yeah, so that's a common problem. And um, and here's how I actually explain it to both veterans and to hiring managers as, a, as you kind of think about this problem, right? Um, so a lot of my West Point classmates have recently retired as colonels or one-star generals. And now they're ask, actually asking me, Jim, can you give me some career advice? And my common theme that I tell them is, Yes, you have great leadership skills. You have great things that you've developed in the military that corporate America is going to love, but you have no experience in corporate America. So you have to be realistic about your initial entry point. And that's the key point. It's an initial entry point. So most likely military talent is going to come in at a level, one level, give or take below where they probably really should be. And that's because they need to learn the business. They need to learn the industry. They need to learn the particular company. And then they should be skyrocketing up to where they belong. And the, the analogy I use is that um, we wouldn't take a vice president from Prudential and make him a brigade commander. Why would we take a brigade commander and make him a vice president at Prudential? They both have leadership capabilities. They both understand what it takes to lead at that level. What they don't understand is the nuances of the military or the nuances of corporate America. But given time, whatever that might be, whether it's six, 12 or 18 months or whatever, they can both learn because they've had a distinguished career of learning how to take on different roles and assignments and to lead. And leadership is the key point here. The reason we hire military talent is teamwork, leadership and grit. It's not for their ta technical acumen that we can teach you and that we will teach you. And then you'll be able to have that position. So that's the guidance I give both to hiring managers and to peers in the military who are transitioning out to say, look, you're not going to 
typically you're not going to step in right at that level. But think of it this way. It's an initial entry point and you're going to we're going to set you up for an opportunity to rise. That's what they should be looking for. Bravo comments, Jim. Bravo. <laughs> uh, I just want to address this to Anne really quickly here. Again, I, we've ha we're having a great conversation. I think that we can go on and on about this conversation two hours later, but we have nine minutes. Um, but I wanted to ask this to Anne. Um, and I know that, and I'm saying this, just putting it all out there, Maximus, we could do a better job at some things, right? So um, based on maybe trial and error of things that you try to do to help identify veterans, either the students or the uh, staff there, what things do you think you can probably work on? And I know a lot of people have the same questions like we tried this, but this is it didn't work. Um, and I think a lot of times when we have these discussions, uh, when they know somebody else probably had the same trials and tribulations, they don't feel so bad. Right. That's kind of what brought me to the realization. I'm not a bad person. <laughs> Other companies have done this. So is there something that you've done that wasn't, you know, it didn't work out so well, but you're kind of learning and kind of you know, navigating that process to do better? Well, I think. It's a little bit of a different answer because it's touching on something that Haley said, and, and I believe something even you said, but uh, in a question in the, in the comments, uh, cultural competency education. All right. I think that's the benefit. So we do that at Rutgers. We created one unique specific cultural competency for Rutgers, and we've actually done it with corporate partners. Um, Jim, I don't know if you've ever participated in one, but we've definitely done it. Um, with different partners the, through the business school and cultural competency education or a green zone training. So anyone who's in the military knows green zones, the safe zone, it goes hand in hand with visibility. So if you create a culture of support, you're encouraging people to identify, you're helping recruiters specifically get over maybe unconscious bias about yes, to the point, not every veteran has post-traumatic stress disorder. That's something that the one we designed talks about, right? It ident identifies bias that people have. It talks about the military civilian knowledge gap because the more educated as a community we are, and this isn't just in, within our, uh, our corporations, within our companies, with where we work, but as a community as a whole, you know, the better off veterans are, the better off those who serve and their families are. Um, you know, every veteran community is unique as well, depending on where you live. I know you and I spoke about this as far as resources available. If you are in a veteran desert, so to speak, where there's just not a lot of veterans in the area you live in, how much more important is it for you to know about these resources, for your colleagues to understand you and not to immediately maybe have any opinion that's based off of um, you know, media or, uh, you know, headlines. So military cultural competency education, um, there's a lot of places that do it. Rutgers does it for outside organizations. And I would say that's the number one thing because that's really, that's the foundation. And yeah, we had a great conversation. That's why I was trying not to address some of those things. I'm like, Ann and I will be on here for another 40 minutes and then George is going to get mad. <laughs> so I have one more question because I'm like, yes, I have six minutes. Uh, so Haley, you know, when you're talking about in the recruiting perspective, right? Like how you're uh, trying to identify veterans based on what Ann was saying and how we have a dwindling population of veterans, right? Even more, even fewer so of uh, us women um, that are veterans, how do you like get out, outside the box thinking? We've tried some unique things other than buying people puppies, right? So how, how have you kind of said, you know what, we're at, we're at this impasse. How do we kind of get more engaged? Like what are some of the tips and tricks you've done to kind of get more veterans to self-identify in, in the vetting process? Um, absolutely. Echoing on what, what Ann said again is, you know, the, the education part um, is so huge and creating, so, in our organization, our veteran outreach is multifaceted. So we have, you know, me representing the recruiting piece of it, but we also have a community relations team um, who has a huge emphasis on partnering with veteran organizations, even as something like a sponsorship of some type. Um, what could, what that looks like to us could be. Uh, we work with a local local veteran organization that supports homeless veterans, and they're actually going to be moving locations. So we donated a U-Haul truck to them just to create that visibility and that partnership that we as a company, we support veterans. Um, it could be even there are all sorts of veteran resource events, resource events that happen throughout communities. I just went to one on Saturday. Um, this wasn't even necessarily a hiring event. This was an event for veterans to come and get a free haircut, maybe get some clothes, get a hot meal. And we had a table there just to talk about our general support for the veteran community and also to talk about people needing jobs. So it's it's getting as much visibility as you can. And that's not necessarily 
that's not always electronic, I guess is what I'm getting at, is physically getting out there, show up at these events, meet people face to face, and so that it, it becomes resonant, your involvement with the veteran community. Very cool. Okay, four minutes. Yes. One more question, Jim. I promise it's the last one because we got four minutes and you have a two minute response. Okay. So, you know, when you were talking about before about VP kind of coming in at a certain level, but this actually goes back to some, something somebody said in the comments about C-suite, right? Your C-suite. And it's easy for you to kind of understand where the veteran kind of mindset is. And I found that because I'm not C-suite, um, but I've been here long enough where people call me like the Malcolm X of veterans. I'm very vocal and I've gotten, you know, buy-ins from this, the C-suite. What advice would you give to somebody else who's not in your position about kind of getting the C-suite on board to you say, Hey, we got to identify these veterans. I need your help. And this is why. Well, that's a, that's actually an easy question to answer. And the way to, to think about it is how do you make a business value out of anything that we do? So with our work, we always think of it as, I got to add business value and that's what makes it sustainable. So when we created our Office of Veterans Initiatives in 2010, it was right as the kind of the height of unemployment and veter in the veteran space. So it seemed easy to do, it's a good thing to do, but at some point that's gonna wane. And the reason it becomes sustainable is when people see the business value of the program. They see the business value of what we're doing to add talent. So one of the things we talk about from a talent perspective, which is actually pretty interesting, is that um, you think, OK, military talent or veteran talent or however we position it. But what we often forget to say is military talent is the horizontal that cuts across all of the verticals, all of them. You name the, ver the, the demographic vertical, we've got it in the military. So I actually had somebody say this to me not too long ago. Oh, you know, we're kind of done focusing on veterans. We want to focus on people of color and women. Okay, well, guess what? We've got people of color and we've got women in our military candidates between veterans and military spouses. We can help you galore. And part of the problem is that's it's this whole education process. I think there's a theme for today, which is we need to educate our allies and our hiring managers and our organizations to better understand military talent, the military community, because they've got misperceptions about what it is. And they might be thinking, oh, we don't need to hire more vets. We're doing good there, but we need to hire, you know, we need to work on diversity here or diversity there. Military talent's a great way to solve that problem too. Military talent's a great way to get developmental candidates into your organization that can rise uh, through the ranks, right? You might be looking for somebody to come in at an entry-level management position who can rise up through one of your um, rotational developmental programs. Military talent makes a great solution for that. By highlighting that business value, it now becomes easy for a business leader. That's what they think about. They don't think about just doing good. They think about how does this impact the bottom line? How is this going to help my business unit succeed? Show them that, they'll be on board. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree wholeheartedly with all of those things. I mean, I think that, you know, once you get the buy in, but I mean, I, again, <laughs> and we only have a minute, but I've the, the, the identification as far as when we talk about underrepresented minority, I, we are a minority. I think this is what people forget. We are a category of minority. Right. And we do come from all walks of life because we're one of the only kind of careers where it's vetted across all the United States, including Puerto Rico. Right. What other company can say I have an employee or an ex employee in every state in the United States? the military, right? So I think people kind of miss the mark on that and kind of misidentify us. Veterans are their own thing and then other minorities are that, no, we're technically a minority. If you go back to Anne's analogy, we're like 1%. How is that not the minority of America? I don't, I don't understand that. It just makes no sense to me. Um, but 26 seven seconds left. I hope it doesn't cut us off. But I want to thank everybody um, for their candor, Jim and um, and Haley. Um, I try to do my best without talking so much because I'm very passionate about this. Again, Malcolm X of Veterans. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Uh, Courtney did an amazing job leading that panel. Uh, just made the most out of literally every second. Uh, actionable advice. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you. One of the most common questions I hear from uh, organizations uh, is, you know, what you addressed uh, in so much detail, how to better track the, the veteran employees. You can't help those who you don't even realize are veterans working at your uh, organization. Um, some great concrete advice. 
really appreciate it. Um, that concludes uh, our uh, second round of breakouts. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the afternoon lounge sponsored by Oracle. Uh, you can find that uh, by looking at the left side of your screen uh, where it says lobby main stage. Uh, what you're looking for is the one that says lounges. Select that and then select join uh, for the lounge on the right, the Oracle lounge. Uh, that will continue from 2.05 to 2.25. <clears throat> and uh, we will uh, then, after that, pick up our last panel of the day, starting at 2.30 on the main stage. Uh, but uh, do check out that afternoon lounge. We had some great conversations in our morning lounge, uh, which was sponsored by Comcast. Uh, so, uh, you know, really useful stuff there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, panelists. This was a great panel. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, hope, you, uh, hope you all take care.